Uh, all right, so, so let's see. So um, I'm going to, I guess, all, we, we didn't synchronize our titles, but somehow we all end up with uh, zero knowledge for, uh, for X. Um, so in this talk, actually, it's, I think it's kind of interesting. It, it answers some of the questions that uh, Ali brought up uh, by, I hope I'll get to this at the very end, by basically rep replacing Merkle trees by other, other structures, uh, discrete log-based. So we, of course, they're not going to be quantum resistance, but they do uh, compress things uh, quite a bit. So I'm a little bit worried that my, my talk is a little long, so uh, maybe I'll go through the, through the early parts quickly, and uh, I, I hope I can get to the, to the last application and show you kind of how this all works. Uh, all right, so let's start with uh, the very, at, the, at the very beginning. So I, I understand this is kind of a mixed audience. Uh, so let's start with uh, very basic things just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So when we say basic, we mean um, proving that you know a discrete log. Yeah, so the classic Schnorr protocol for, um, yeah, proving that you know a discrete log. Uh, so this is basically, uh, yeah, so with the settings, we have a finite cyclic group. The uh, group has order Q. Uh, the verifier basically has two group elements, U and V. Both of them lie in the group. And the prover just wants to prove uh, that it knows the discrete log of one element based the other. Yeah, so it knows alpha such that V is equal to U to the alpha. Yeah, so that's the goal. Uh, if you want to be more uh, fancy in notation, uh, let me just kind of introduce this. We might use this a little, a little bit later. We can talk about these languages. So the first part of the, of the, of the tuple is the instance. So U, V in this case. Uh, R is the, is the instance of the problem we're trying to prove. The discrete log, alpha, is the witness. So I'll always use Greek letters for the witness. And the goal, of course, is to prove that um, I know a witness for which you, that proves that UV is in this language. All right, so that's in terms of the, lang the uh, language of languages. All right, so, so Schnorr, of course, came up with this protocol that we all uh, know and love. This is kind of all, I would almost say, the prehistory of, of, of crypto, kind of the be beginning of the road. Uh, and I'm citing here the 1989 uh, paper of Schnorr because this is the conference version. Most people cite the journal version, but we should give credit to when the work was actually done. Unfortunately, this protocol was, uh, was patented, as you all know. This is one of the, probably one of the most disastrous patents that um, has kind of prevented us from, 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 from these, uh, the systems that come from this from being standardized. But now, of course, it's expired and it's free for everybody to use. Okay, so how does the protocol work? So I'll just go, go through this quickly. I think everybody knows this. Basically, the prover starts by choosing a random R, sends G to the R over to the verifier. The verifier chooses a random challenge. Uh, the prover sends back, uh, you know, C alpha plus R. Basically, the, the, the challenge, bl the witness blinded by this uh, random verifier, random value, and the verifier accepts if, uh, if this condition holds. Okay, good. So that's the Schnorr protocol. Um, as I said, that we all know and love. It's actually easy to prove that it's honest verifier zero knowledge. I won't go through that. Um, and the question, though, is why is, it, why is it a proof of knowledge? Yeah, so can we actually extract the witness to show that the prover actually knows uh, the discrete log? And again, this is, this is not difficult to show. Basically, if we have two accepting conversations with the same randomness value R, uh, where the challenges are different, then it's actually quite easy to extract the witness. This is a quick review, right? Uh, if you just divide these two verification equations one by the other, you end up with, uh, you know, u to the delta z is equal to v to the delta c. Yeah, and if you can, and, you, and you'd like to basically uh, raise both sides to the, to the power of delta c inverse, which we can do because uh, delta c is invertible in zq, and that gives us the discrete log. Okay, so just keep that in mind. This will come important, become important uh, in just a minute. This kind of works because uh, delta C is invertible in ZQ, which allows us to extract the witness from this, from this protocol. Fantastic. All right. So since we, since we talked about Schnorr, the Schnorr discrete log protocol, I can't resist and just tell you that this is an instance of a much more general class of protocols. And the more general class uh, is basically proving knowledge of a homomorphism pre-image. Yeah? So let me just make sure everybody... Uh, Oops, everybody knows this. What just happened? Let me just make sure everybody knows this too. Uh, yeah, so we can use uh, 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 exactly the same protocol to prove that we know a, a pre-image of a homomorphism. So the setup here is we have some homomorphism from between two groups, G1 to G2. And we just want to prove, yeah, the prover, the verifier has 
uh, V, which is phi of alpha, and the prover wants to prove that it knows this alpha. And exactly the same protocol works. Yeah, so you can see exactly uh, the same thing. I choose R in G1, I send you phi of R, I send, uh, verify I send back a challenge, I send you Z, which is also in G1, and you accept kind of under a similar verification condition. All right, so this is just a generalization of uh, Schnorr. The interesting thing about this is, although it looks like a trivial generalization, it actually captures a really large class of protocols. Yeah, very large class of protocols. And just to give one example, like suppose, I think on Wednesday, uh, we, uh, there was a couple of talks mentioned this equality of discrete log uh, problem, uh, this equality of discrete log protocol. I can never remember how this protocol works. But if you just remember it as an instance of this pre, uh, phi pre-image, then it's easy to derive it yourself. Yeah, so uh, all that happens, so what are we trying to prove here? We have u, v, u prime, and v prime, and we want to prove that uh, the discrete log of uh, v base u is the same as the discrete log of v prime base u prime. So all you do is you define this homomorphism. You can see that the homomorphism just, homomorphism just maps x to u to the x and u prime to the x. Yeah, so one witness uh, maps us to a, to a pair, and now you just plug this homomorphism into the Schnorr protocol, and you can see that you basically derive immediately what's called the sean pedersen protocol for equality of discrete logs. Right? You have a blinding value, you have a challenge, and the, the uh, instance, that comes, there's a z that comes back, and then this verification equation now compares that uh, this is like two equations rolled up into one because the homomorphism itself outputs a pair. Yeah? So you can verify that this pair is equal to this pair, and then you accept. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that a very large class of discrete log protocols just fall out as very special instances of uh, generalized Schnorr just by choosing the homomorphism correctly. So generally, as a rule of thumb, if you have a zero knowledge problem that you're trying to solve, uh, the minute you can specify it as a homomorphism, you're done. Yeah, you can just plug it into the generalized Schnorr and you get your zero knowledge protocol. So often, it's been instructive for me to just look for these homomorphisms and then um, zero knowledge just comes out for free. So far, so good? Oh, yeah. The exponentiation of L and the scalable division are uh, coordinate-wise. Uh, coordinate-wise, yeah. You would multiply both coordinates. You would raise both coordinates to the power of C. Exactly. Yeah, you interpret this as an equation on, on pairs. Ah, okay. I don't know why this is happening. Ah, okay. So, there we go. Good. Okay, so, uh, so far, so good. So, in fact, we can generalize this generalized Schnorr uh, allows us to prove to do zero knowledge on arbitrary circuits. So uh, I, here I, I use the language of R1CS, but if you're not comfortable with R1CS, think of general uh, arithmetic circuits. So, you know, literally you can capture general arithmetic circuits. Um, again, you can think of them as R1CS programs. You can capture them using homomorphisms very easily, and directly you get, you get proof, uh, zero knowledge proofs that you know are satisfying assignment to a circuit. Uh, the um, proof size basically is roughly uh, linear in the number of inputs and the number of multiplication gates in the circuits. Yeah, so it's a linear size proof. Uh, and that's what we get from Schnorr. All right, so uh, more recently, there's a, you know, there's a better way to do these discrete log type proofs. So there's a proof system uh, called bulletproofs based on uh, discrete logs that actually improves exponentially over Schnorr. Yeah, so the proof size drops from n plus m to log of n plus m. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, due to Budolal and Budolal and uh, a, num a number of people in the audience, uh, lo lots of authors here, so I, I uh, can't actually expand this all out. <laughs> um, but anyhow, this is, uh, kind of shows that uh, sh in the, for, ver for larger circuits, Schnorr, pr Schnorr proofs kind of are now really kind of dead, yeah? You should not really be using Schnorr. Uh, bulletproofs are exactly the same setups as Schnorr. There's no trusted setup. There's only a discrete log assumption. Uh, and effectively, you get a much, much uh, shorter proof. So the question is kind of where's the cutoff? Like if you have very small circuits, it still makes sense to use the Schnorr protocol. If you have larger circuits, it makes more sense to use bulletproofs. And so the question is where's the cutoff? And it turns out it's at around 15 multiplication gates. Yeah, so if your circuit has around um, 15 multiplication gates, it's uh, more than 15 multiplication gates, uh, you, you know, you should be just using these shorter proofs. If uh, not, then you're still better off using Schnorr. Yeah, question. You're saying that the general term pair just tells us things that describe Yes. We can think of it as one homomorphism somehow? Yes, you can map that very easily to homomorphism. There's a direct map. Uh, you have to commit to a few values, and then it's a direct map to homor homomorphism. You can plug that into Schnorr, and you'll get the linear size proof, or you can plug that into bulletproofs, and you'll get the logarithmic size proof. By the way, I have to say, the difference between Schnorr and bulletproofs 
it's very interesting that it's kind of uh, basically what Ali was saying. Yeah, Schnorr is a, is a three-round protocol. It's a Sigma protocol, whereas Bulletproofs is a log-n round protocol. So really interaction, kind of going back to Ali's point, interaction really, really simplifies things a lot. In particular, it lets us kind of get this exponential improvement in, in signature length, in proof length. Yeah? Shouldn't the cost of what? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, this was supposed to be n plus m. Sorry, my mistake. This was supposed to be n plus m, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so this is a good thing to remember. Uh, these are the comparisons. All right, so now, to be honest, if, since this was supposed to be a talk about zero knowledge uh, and using discrete log, what I naturally should have been doing now is describing how bulletproofs work. Yeah, that would be kind of the natural thing to do, but I don't want to do that. Yeah, so we'll leave that for another time. Instead, I want to tell you about some other issues with discrete log proofs, okay? So now... Forget everything we talked about so far, and let's move on. Let's talk about other issues with discrete log proofs. So the question I want to talk about is what happens when we do when we generalize the Schnorr protocol to other types of groups, in particular groups for which we don't know the order of the group. Yeah, the verifier does not know the order of the group. So examples are like the RSA group, right? The verifier there's a public modulus n. Nobody knows the the what fi the factorization of n. So that's an example of a group of unknown order. Of course, it requires a trusted setup uh, if, you want to have, if you want to use small moduli to make sure that nobody knows the factorization of n. If you want, like to use groups of unknown order without a trusted setup, you can use class groups. But these are nice examples of um, groups of unknown order. By the way, there's a wonderful open problem here, which is class groups are a group of unknown order without a trusted setup, but the group operation is somewhat inefficient. Yeah, it's a wonderful open problem for mathematicians uh, to come up with other groups where we cannot tell the order of the group, uh, but we want the group operation to be much faster and uh, group elements should be, uh, should be much smaller. Yeah, this is a wonderful open problem that we don't have a solution to. Yeah. Yes? But also for the existing class groups, is there no hope to improve the algorithm? To... Yeah, the algorithm is, there have been a number of competitions now. The algorithms have become pretty much as good as they're going to get, um, and they're significantly slower <coughs> than arithmetic mod n. Yeah, so there's a cost. What was it? The cost is like, uh, it's like 10 to 20 times slower than Zn. Yeah, so there's definitely a cost to it. All right, so yeah, so, so fine. So, let's, so the question is, uh, can we do discrete log proofs in these groups of unknown order? And so you say, well, fine, let's just generalize the Schnorr protocol. So now we can't just choose R in ZQ because we don't know what the order of the group is. So we have to choose R in some large enough interval to ensure zero knowledge. We'll send G to the R over. We'll get our challenge back. And then now we send back an integer. Yeah, since the group order is unknown, we can think of the exponents as just general integers, right? Because we can't reduce mod any, mod any value. We're just thinking of them as integers, so fine. So I'll choose an integer blinding value. I'll send back an integer value of z, and I'll accept if this condition holds. Yeah, so in fact, this is not too difficult to prove that it's zero knowledge. It requires a statistical argument, but it's not a very difficult statistical argument, and you can say this is zero knowledge. Fantastic. So we have our Schnorr protocol in groups of unknown order. Yeah, so one thing that I wanted to point out, actually, is that the verifier's work, you realize the verifier has to do work here that's proportional to the size of the witness. Yeah, Z, you notice, is proportional to the size of the witness, and the verifier has to raise to the power of Z. So if you have a gigantic witness, the poor verifier has to work pretty darn hard to verify this proof. So that was a side note. But so far, so good, yeah? So we have a protocol. What is there more to say? Well, there's only one problem. Yeah, this protocol is completely insecure. Yeah, so let me explain why it's insecure. First of all, we run into an extraction problem. Remember how when the group was, uh, had known order, had known prime order to extract, we needed to assume that delta C was invertible mod Q. Well, now, we're, now we need to do inversion over the integers. But delta C, there are not too many delta Cs that are invertible over the integers. Only one and minus one are invertible. Otherwise, delta C is not invertible, so our extractor fails. So yeah, so immediately our proof of security kind of evaporates. But it's not just a proof of security issue. There really is an attack on this protocol. So let's just walk through this attack quickly, which is to say, suppose that the values v and u that I'm trying to prove discrete log of are such that the attacker, the, 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 ver the prover, actually does not know the discrete log. Yeah, so suppose um, the prover knows that v is equal to the square root of u. 
Yeah, so it's easy to set up. That just means u is equal to v squared. Remember, u is the base, and v is the element we're trying to prove knowledge of discrete log for. So the problem here is the discrete log is one half. It's not an integer. It's a rational number. And even though the, uh, the, the prover here does not know an integer discrete log, yeah, so the protocol should fail, because the, again, prover does not know an integer discrete log, it's actually quite easy for the prover to pass this protocol. Yeah, so how does the prover uh, convince the verifier? Well, he would just use alpha equals 1 half, and as long as the challenge is even, yeah, if c is even, c times alpha is an integer, and everything goes through. Yeah, so if the verifier happens to send an even challenge, then we're out of luck, and the prover and the verifier will be convinced, even though the prover did not know the discrete log. So that shows this protocol actually doesn't, doesn't actually work. All right, so what do we do? Well, unfortunately, it turns out there's even an impossibility result um, that says that, in fact, no Schnorr-like protocol can achieve a soundness error that's less than one half. There's like a barrier that this one half is not just uh, for this protocol. There's a very large class of protocols that can't be improved. But if you look at the proof, there's actually a very strong assumption that be, being made in that proof in that there is actually no, they, they would refer to it as a common reference string, but really the assumption of the proof is that the prover must know the discrete log of all group elements that it generates. Yeah, so it's not allowed to have any group element for which it does not know the discrete log. Yeah, that's the assumption in this impossibility proof. It turns out if you do give, if you are allowed to use group elements for which nobody knows the discrete log, Nobody knows a square root or a cube root of these elements. It turns out all, all of a sudden there are uh, good zero knowledge protocols. So we show this in the paper. Um, and then in fact, uh, yeah, you can actually get, you can actually do uh, proofs of discrete log even in these uh, groups. You just need some elements um, that are sort of uh, primitive so that nobody knows their, their, uh, any root of those elements. You, you would wonder, well, how do we actually prove security of these protocols? Can we actually get an extraction proof to work? Unfortunately, the only way we can prove security, we can only prove extraction, is either using a complicated knowledge assumption, but in our case, we just to use, chose to use actually a proof in, a proof in uh, generic groups. So you can prove that if the prover is restricted to a generic group, then in fact the extractor can extract um, the discrete log from the prover. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's just one thing that's, that's, uh, that's good for you to know. I hope we're not gonna have an argument now whether, you know, we had an argument about random oracles. I don't know if we wanna have arguments now about generic proofs, but, uh, generic proofs, but I'll say they're worse than random oracles. Yeah, uh, from a theoretical point of view, in practice, what? <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. As long as you don't call them symmetric hip codes. As long as what? If you don't call them symmetric hip codes. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see, I see, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. What? He said that uh, when, we, when we refer to random oracles, we refer to them as symmetric crypto. So he said, don't call these things symmetric crypto. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, so fine. So, so far, so good. So now we have these zero knowledge proofs actually even in uh, groups of, of uh, unknown order. But let me ask you, let's move away a little bit now from the spirit of this workshop a little bit. And let's ask this question about not worrying about zero knowledge proofs. Let's just talk about uh, proving knowledge, yeah? So suppose I wanted to prove to you that I actually um, know the discrete log of an element, but I don't care about being zero knowledge, yeah? So this sounds silly. If I don't care about zero knowledge, the prover can just send the discrete log to the verifier, and the verifier would check that uh, v is equal to u to the alpha. So we're done. So what is there more to say, yeah? Um, fair enough. So, like, what is there more to say? Well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to say that the verifier's work should actually be uh, independent of the size of the witness. Yeah, so this is more like uh, outsourcing exponentiation. We'd like to have a proof where I can verify that exponentiation was done correctly, and the verifier's proof should be independent of the size of the exponent. That's, that's the question. So can we do that? Yeah, so we'll have some sort of a, of a proof a proof between a verifier and the prover. It's not going to be a zero-knowledge proof, but we'd like the verifier to have a very fast decision test. You remember I told you in the basic Schnorr protocol, the verifier's work was linear, in, was linear in the size of alpha. We'd like it to be independent of the size of alpha. All right, so let's do this in two steps. Let me show you, first of all, a very cute result, very, very, very cool result, very recent, uh, from uh, Benjamin Maslowski that allows you to do a proof of exponentiation. Yeah, so I can outsource exponentiation to a prover. The prover sends me back the results, and I can verify 
that that proof worked correctly. So here's how this proof goes. So first of all, you notice here, we're just doing a proof of exponentiation, meaning that the verifier actually here knows the exponent. So this doesn't solve the problem we wanted to solve, but this is the first step. All right, so how does the proof work? Well, it's really simple. Again, this is in groups of unknown order. Always our setup is groups of unknown order. So the way this works is basically the verifier is gonna send a, choose a random prime, so a 128-bit prime, uh, and then it's gonna send it over to the prover. The prover, what he will do is he will compute, uh, take the exponent alpha and write it basically, uh, you know, mod Q, uh, divided by Q, so he, sorry, divided by L. So he'll write it as Q times L plus R, where R is a number between zero and L. And what he'll do is he'll send the quotient back to the verifier. That's it. The quotient back to the verifier. What does the, ver what does the verifier do? The verifier is just gonna test this equality here in the exponent. So what does that mean? Basically, you take Q, here, you take Q, you raise it to the L, so you see this gives you little Q times L plus R, and we're gonna check that that's equal to V. So literally, we're just che checking this equality in the exponent. Yeah, that's what this does. And uh, the only thing the verifier has to do here is compute the remainder itself. So it computes alpha mod L on its own. All right. No, alpha could be alpha could be uh, much 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 larger than the size of the representations of u and v. You don't know the group order, so you can't reduce alpha mod the group order. So alpha here is this could be some arbitrarily large integer. It's a very good question. Okay. Yeah, alpha can be a very 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 large integer, and in fact, this is kind of where this proof comes from, where you're trying to prove a very large exponentiation in a group of unknown order, so you can't just reduce alpha mod the group order. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so in fact, that's a very good point. In fact, here, V's running time does depend on alpha, although you realize it's actually, uh, uh, all, the, all the verifier has to do is just take alpha and reduce it mod L. He doesn't have to raise anything to the power of alpha. Yeah, so it's much faster than exponentiation, but you're absolutely right. This, is not, this does not achieve our goal, right? The verifier's work is still uh, proportional to the size of the witness, to the size of alpha. Okay, so this is a pretty interesting protocol, right? I mean, like, what can we say about this protocol? Is it sound? Is it secure? I mean, so it turns out you can actually prove that this protocol is sound under a new type of assumption. Yeah, this assumption is called the adaptive root problem. Uh, I don't want to, just in the interest of time, I don't want to define the adaptive root problem. All I'll say is, and since the spirit of this talk, we're actually working with uh, generic groups, I'll just say the adaptive root problem holds in generic groups of unknown order. So we'll just take it as a given. Yeah. <sighs> okay, fine. So adaptive root is actually very similar to strong RSA. It's a, it's a brother of, sister of uh, strong RSA. Yeah, so essentially um, you, uh, you give, you output, the prover outputs, the adversary outputs an element, he's given a random uh, L, and he has to produce an Lth root of that element. Yeah, so it's adaptive root because which root you're asked to compute is chosen by the verifier after you committed to the group element. Yeah. So you can prove this actually holds in generic groups. So you know we'll take it as a given, and under that this protocol is sound. Yeah. So this proves this is a pretty cool way to outsource exponentiation in a group of unknown order. So I don't know. It's a very simple, very elegant protocol, but it doesn't solve our problem. Yeah. Question. No, no, see the proof, the verifier, you're saying the verifier could have just computed the exponentiation itself by just computing u to the alpha. But computing u to the alpha is practically much slower than just computing alpha mod L. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 Look, if alpha has special structure, then, then, there, we, we're, then we're a different, different world, yeah? So if alpha has a special structure, like alpha is a power of two, then computing alpha mod L is trivial. Yeah, then asymptotically it's faster. For a generic alpha, this would be, uh, this would be um, uh, like poly lambda faster, yeah, asymptotically. But in practice, of course, this is a, this is a speed up of like 10, uh, you know, 1,000 times faster. It's a significant speed up. Yeah, okay, but this doesn't achieve our goal, right? Our goal was basically to prove, remember, that, uh, that the verifier's work should, in, should be independent of alpha. Okay, so let me show you a fast proof of knowledge for discrete log where the verifier's work actually is independent of alpha. Um, and so the way, this, the way this proof works, and as I said, we're gonna need 
this uh, CRS here. So but the CRS is a very weak CRS. All it is is just an, a, an, a random element in the group for which nobody knows any roots. Yeah? So you just assume somebody gave you a group element out of thin air, and not, nobody knows any roots of this group element. So now the protocol works as follows. Yeah? So we start off by sending the prover sends g to the alpha over to the verifier. So the prover has to do uh, one additional exponentiation. The verifier sends, as before, a prime. And then what the prover will do is it will send you, um, oh, well, it will compute alpha, again, divided by, by this prime just as before. And it will send you uh, u to the quotient as before, but it will also send you g to the quotient. Now, the major difference between this protocol and the previous protocol is in the previous protocol, the verifier is the one that computed the remainder. Here, uh, the verifier is going to re rely on the prover to compute the remainder. It's fundamentally different uh, from before. And then we accept if basically, let's see, this exponentiation proof holds for uh, u and v, and this exponentiation proof holds for g and z. Yeah, so in some sense, we're kind of checking two exponentiation proofs in parallel here, one relative to a, a fresh element g, and one rel relevant relative to the u and v elements. Okay, and it's critical to do this way. If you change anything, this, this breaks. Yeah, so that's the protocol. You notice now the, uh, the verifiers work is now only these two simple exponentiations, both of them are, are short, independent on how, of how big alpha is. So very fast verification. Yeah? Why is it necessary that uh, L is prime? Because even though L is prime, you get smoothing. Yeah, so if L is not prime, then you get smoothing attacks. For example, uh, what happens is um, if L is just happens to be an integer, unfortunately, it turns out that uh, it has a decent chance of being a smooth integer divisible only by small primes, and then it breaks. Yeah, so primes is just a way for us to get rid of these uh, smoothing attacks. If you don't like primes, you can, use, you can just make L be very large so that, the, so that it's unlikely to be smooth, but this seems more efficient. Yeah? Another question? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, so these are very small primes. These are like 128-bit primes. Yeah, so generating a 128-bit prime is not that difficult. There's a lot of literature on how to do that qu quickly. So I'm just going to take that as a fast operation. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. OK, fantastic. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of where we are. Uh, so the verifier's work, you realize now, is independent of the size of the witness. Um, and in fact, there's a small optimization you can do. Maybe you don't like the fact that we send both Q and Q prime. If you look at the verification equation, you know that there's a standard trick of verifying two equations like this for the cost of one, just using a little bit more randomization. So in fact, you know, we can kind of uh, randomly combine this Q and Q prime using a random S, and then just verify one verification equation. So really, the witness here, the, the proof here is just Q prime, Q, Q double prime, and that's it. So there's a single proof element that's being sent Where over. Where does S come from? What? Where does S come from? Yeah, so S would come from the verifier. S, I, didn't, I didn't change the protocol too much. S would be sent from the verifier. It turns out there's an extra step that needs to be done if you do that. But just keep in mind that we can think of the proof as just being Q double prime. OK. Uh, OK, fantastic. Excellent. Uh, so the question is, why is this secure? So can we extract, uh, yeah, can we extract the witness alpha from this protocol? Like, is this really uh, a proof of knowledge? By the way, I really should be calling this arguments of knowledge, because we're assuming nobody can compute the order of the group. If you knew the order of the group, this would, would be insecure. So really, I should be calling this an argument of knowledge, but proof of knowledge is, is easier to say. So I'm just going to stick with proof of knowledge. Ah, why does this? Okay. Yes, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, so can we extract? Well, uh, so to, to uh, again, unfortunately, to prove that this protocol is secure, we have to assume that the group of unknown order is generic. Yeah, so this is, again, uh, we could have used a knowledge assumption, but it just seemed more elegant to actually just prove this under a generic, uh, in a generic model. And uh, I, the proof, actually, I don't know, it's kind of a cute uh, proof in that, of course, the idea is that what we're going to do to extract alpha, we're going to re rewind the prover and send him many, many Ls, and you realize every time we give him a different prime, he gives us alpha mod that prime. So we're going to run the prover with lots and lots of Ls, collect alpha mod L1, alpha mod L2, alpha mod L3, and so on and so forth. That presumably will give us alpha. The problem is, how do we know that this alpha actually comes from an integer and not from a rational number? Right? The problem with these protocols is that uh, alpha might be rational, and then the attacker can cheat. And it turns out, kind of by using this G of, uh, for which uh, kind of this fresh element of the group, we can kind of force the attacker 
to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, use an integer alpha so that this extraction technique actually works. Yeah, so it's kind of a cute argument that uh, I'm not going to go through here, but you can, see, uh, you can see in the paper. Yeah, so first of all, we have extraction in generic groups. Of course, uh, I guess Henry on Wednesday said that uh, we cryptographers, we just say use FHMIR and um, we leave it to, de to the developers to figure out how to do it. So I guess, I guess I just wanted to be explicit. The proof really is this element Z and Q double prime. So the proof is just two elements in the group of unknown order. And the way you generate the prime is you do a hash to prime on the transcript. The way you generate hash uh, S is you just do a hash uh, to an integer on the transcript. And that's basically all the, ver and then the verifier just has to verify the verification equation. Yeah, so that's how we, um, that's basically w uh, how we make this proof non-interactive. So here's a, so one thing that, that, that's really interesting is that in fact, uh, you have to be really careful, really, really careful in which groups you use this protocol. So in particular, the group ZN star does not, cannot be modeled as, uh, modeled as, a, gener as a generic group. Yeah, as a generic group of unknown order. The problem um, in a generic group of unknown order, there can be no elements of known order. Yeah, generic groups requires everything looks random. You cannot know any element. You cannot know the order of any element. Unfortunately, in ZN star, there is an element for which you know its order. Can somebody tell me what that is? What? One? Well, yeah, I, well, I, okay, fine. I should have said the non-identity non element. Other than one, is there another element for which you know its order? Ah, yeah, thank you, minus one. Yeah, so minus one has order two. And in fact, minus one, if, if you just did this protocol in ZN star, it would be insecure. Yeah, there's an easy attack in which, again, uh, I would not know, the prover would not know the discrete log, but he can fool the verifier with probability one half. So these low order elements actually are a real, are a real problem for this protocol. So we have to get rid, rid of all the low order elements. And the way we get rid of the low order elements, well, minus one is the only one that we know of. And so we're just gonna quotient by the subgroup plus minus one. And so we're gonna get these, this is called a group of signed residues. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna work in this group of signed residues where now we don't know the order of any element. Yeah, so it's really, really important to work in that group. Otherwise, this is insecure. And I'll say that this generalizes, again, to, the, to proving a pre-image of arbitrary homomorphisms. So it's a general proof of knowledge. Okay, so far, so good. Excellent. So, the yeah. What? Ah. How do you hash elements in generic groups? How do you, how do, you do what? Hash the elements, yeah. How do you hash elements in generic groups? Yeah. Well, if you remember, elements in generic groups are represented as random bit strings. So you just hash those bit strings. Yeah, that's explicit. Yep. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, so why am I telling you all this? Why is this, why is this relevant to anything? Uh, yeah, what is this all good for? And the answer is, this, the, all these tools actually uh, turned out to be quite useful in the realm of accumulators, in particular the RSA accumulator. Um, and that all, all of a sudden can be used to, to uh, shrink a lot of the work that Ali was doing uh, with IOPs. Basically, these accumulators can be, can be a, a drop in replacement for Merkle trees. Yeah, and so let me, explain, uh, let me explain how. So what is an accumulator? First of all, let me just quickly remind everybody so we're all on the same page. What is an accumulator? It's just a way to commit to a set. Yeah, so I can commit to a set of elements. We'll call the commitment A for accumulator. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so we have this uh, commitment U1 to UN. Then there's a proof, easy proof of inclusion. So given an element U in the set, there's a short proof that proves that U is in the set S. So the accumulator is short and the proof that U is in the set S is short. There's an easy way, of course, to verify if the proof is valid or not. So this should look familiar, like Merkle trees are an example of an accumulator, very short proof for a short commitment to a set. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip over the security requirements. There should be, a, there, typically there's additional uh, desirable properties, like it should be easy to add and remove elements from the accumulator. So if I give you an accumulator and, a, and an element U, you should be able to add the element to the accumulator, remove the element from the accumulator. And finally, you should be also able to prove non-inclusion uh, so that given an element U that's not in the accumulator, I'd like to prove that it's not in the accumulator. Okay, so these are properties of accumulators. And you know Merkle proofs, Merkle trees satisfy all these properties, right? I can prove that something is in the Merkle tree, I can prove that something is not in the Merkle tree, uh, so all good. However, there are these algebraic accumulators, the RSA accumulators, that actually turn out to have uh, pretty much in more interesting properties than just Merkle trees. So let me remind you quickly, what is, the, what is the RSA accumulator? If we want to accumulate values U1 to UN, again, we're going to hash the values to primes. 
Uh, here, the reason I use two to the two lambda here is because we need this hash to be collision resistant. Um, yeah, so we're going to hash the elements to primes, and then the value of the accumulator is just a base element raised to all these exponents. Okay, that's, that's how we accumulate values. And now you all probably uh, know the way I prove inclusion is I just give you uh, a root of the accumulator. So if I want to prove that u is in the accumulator, I give you an e used root of the accumulator. That's the proof. And you can easily verify it by just raising the proof to the power of e u, and that gives you, and check that that's equal to the accumulator value. Yes, so far so good. By the way, you realize that if I give you a proof of non-inclusion, that all, sorry, a proof of inclusion, that also allows you to remove the element to you from the accumulator because the proof itself is the accumulator with the element you removed. Good. Fine. So we, can ha we have proofs of inclusions. We can do removals. Um, we can also do proofs of non-inclusion. By the way, this is a little bit less, uh, less known and uh, not, so, not so simple to see, but it turns out there's actually a very, very clever uh, trick that lets you prove that an element is not in the accumulator. The proof is basically one group element and one um, integer, one small integer. There's a way to verify that that proof actually is correct. And, you know, this is a secure accumulator if the strong RSA assumption holds. Okay, so those are kind of uh, a quick summary of the RSA accumulator. So what am I why am I telling you about all this? Well, it turns out using these proofs of knowledge, these new proofs of knowledge, uh, we, can do, we can do kind of magical things with these accumulators. In particular, for example, we can compress a whole, but of, a whole bunch of inclusion proofs into a single value, right? So in a Merkle tree, remember, this was the kind of what Ali was pointing out. In a Merkle tree, if you have to do n proofs of inclusion, you have to give n, um, what did you call them? n uh, uh, inclusion paths, right? You had a name for it. What was the name? Authentication path, right? If you want to do any inclusion proofs, you have to give n authentication paths. There's no way to compress these n authentication paths together. The amazing thing about the RSA accumulator is if I give you n distinct inclusion proofs, so here I prove to you that n elements are in the accumulator, it's trivial to actually compress all of them into a single proof. Yeah, so I can aggregate all the proofs using what's called the Shamir trick, right? So I have an e1 root of a up to an en root of a. Using these roots, I can easily build in E1 to En roots of A. Yes, and this proves, and this is a single proof that proves that all the elements are in the accumulator. So whoosh, we compress all the authentication proofs into a single proof. The problem is, yeah, so we can't do this with Merkle proofs, yeah, with Merkle trees. The problem with this is now the poor verifier, you realize he has to do this massive exponentiation to verify that the inclusion proof is correct. Yeah, you have to raise, it, you know, if this is like, you know, uh, 1,000 or 10,000 elements that you're doing inclusion proofs of, now all of a sudden the verifier is stuck doing this, doing this massive exponentiation. So you probably see where I'm going, right? What are we going to do? Instead of making the verifier do this massive exponentiation, the aggregator, the person that aggregated all these proofs together, is just going to give a, a short proof of exponentiation. And yeah, so all he does is he gives this pi and q, it's a short proof of exponentiation, uh, and the verifier not just needs to do lambda work. Rather than alpha work, the verifier just needs to do lambda work. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I can compress a whole bunch of uh, inclusion proofs together, and verifying them is no harder than verifying a single proof. Yeah, this is kind of a, I don't know, this is a pretty powerful tool. Please keep, in keep it in your tool set, because uh, this uh, comes up a lot. Yeah. Uh, this, this would, no, not stronger RSA. This would be to, to make sure that this inclusion, that this, that this proof is correct. At the very least, you need the adaptive root assumption. But in fact, we need this to be extractable, so actually you need, you need generic, proof, generic groups for this. Yeah, strong assumptions, but you get amazing results, amazing construction. Adaptive root is covered by the stronger Yeah, adaptive root, no, no, adaptive root, generic groups imply adaptive root. Because if you're assuming stronger RSA. Stronger RSA is not enough for this. No, 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 you cannot prove the secure under stronger essay. Yeah, yeah, you need more, you need more properties from the group. This is, by the way, why you, uh, accumulators are secure in ZN star. This is not secure in ZN star. You have to quotient out by plus minus one. Otherwise, this is insecure. Yeah, it's a, it's a little subtle. Okay, fantastic. So, ah, okay, so I need to stop, so I'm almost there. Uh, we can do the same thing for aggregating uh, uh, exclusion, uh, exclusion proofs, so not just inclusion proofs. For aggregating exclusion proofs, we have to use this uh, proof of uh, knowledge of exponent, and we can kind of get uh, the same thing. And by the way, um, one kind of fundamental difference between the RSA accumulator and a Merkle tree is a Merkle tree is positional, right? The Merkle tree 
uh, not, it doesn't just commit to a set, it actually commits to a vector, right? Every uh, element has a position in the tree. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out you can actually con uh, uh, convert the RSA accumulator into what's called a vector commitment, so you commit to a vector rather than a set, um, and the same results, kind of, the same uh, um, batching techniques apply, um, apply here as well. All right, so, boy, so I guess I should stop now. So I was going to show you how this is going to all shrink the size of, of blockchains, but I think I'm out of time. So maybe I will, I will talk about that if you're interested in seeing. Yeah, please, can you continue, please? Oh, really? I think it's worth the five minutes of break, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, good, good, good. So let's do that quickly. Also, I'll, do, I'll, I'll just need five minutes. I'll do it very quickly. All right, so let me, so let me give you just this. I'll, I'll show you how to compress um, the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah, so we'll do it just in the context of Bitcoin. It applies equally to account-based systems like Ethereum. You would just need to replace the accumulator by a vector commitment, that, as I mentioned. All right, so how do we compress the Bitcoin blockchain? So you have to remember, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what the UTXO model is. So the, UT, so the UTXO model is the following. Uh, a transaction basically has inputs and outputs. Yeah, and all the value is held in these unspent transaction outputs. That's what, that's what a UTXO stands for. Yeah, so UTXO1 holds a certain value, UTXO2 holds a certain value. When a new transaction comes in, it just points to an old UTXO, and this spends this UTXO so no one else can spend this UTXO. Yeah, so if you look on the Bitcoin blockchain, all the funds, all the value is held in the unspent transaction outputs on the chain. Fantastic. Unfortunately, this UTXO set is growing and growing and growing and growing. Right now, it's at 70 million uh, UTXOs. Um, you know, a UTXO is about 64 bytes, so this is like, you know, several gigabytes, several gigabytes of data that all the miners have to keep in memory. And the reason they have to keep it in memory is when a transaction comes in, they have to make sure that the, all the UTXOs in that transaction have not yet been spent. Yeah, so they have to make sure that, it's, that it, the input UTXOs are in the set, the current set of UTXOs. So this is a big headache for miners. You know, they have to store, they have to buy these machines with lots of memory. As this grows, it's going to get harder and harder to do these checks. And so the question is, can we do something better? Can we kind of shrink the amount of memory that miners require? And the perfect answer there is uh, accumulators. Yeah, so rather than storing the UTXOs as, uh, as a set, let's store commitments to the UTXO using an accumulator. Yeah, so the miner basically has an accumulator for the current UTXO set. So all the miner has to store in memory is just one commitment, and that's it. Yeah, so this would be like uh, 256 bytes. So literally, you can store the blockchain on your iPhone. 256 bytes, that's it. Uh, now, when a new block is created, a block itself is going to have like 1,000 transactions in it. So let's think a little bit about what do you have to do when you, when you accept a new block. Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to remove all the expiring UTXOs from the current accumulators, right? So you have to check, first of all, that all the incoming UTXO are on the accumulator. Then you need to remove them. And then you need to, to add all the new, newly created UTXO to this accumulator. Yeah, so checking a block or mining a block basically means remove the spent UTXOs and add the new UTXOs. Yeah, so we have to do a removal from the accumulator and then in addition to the accumulator. Yeah. yeah but, but to generate a transaction, when I want to spend money, I, then I do need to store all this UTXO. Excellent question. Hold that thought. Okay. Just one second. Okay. One second. Okay, so let's just uh, expand a bit about what the miner has to do. So the miner's work basically, uh, the miner is going to take proofs of inclusion. So every transaction that contains a UTXO is going to come with a proof that says this UTXO is in the unspent, the current unspent set. Okay, so n transactions come in, they're going to come, or n UTXO come in, they're going to come with n proofs. What the miner has to do is he has to, to remove them from the accumulator. Yeah, so you have to compute the appropriate routes. He has to check then that, in fact, uh, they, really are on the they really are on the accumulator. So the way you check that is you make sure that really all these proofs are actually correct. So if I raise to the, to the, to the appropriate powers, I actually get the value of the accumulator. Okay, so this means... Is this clear? This means that um, uh, all the UTXOs that claim to be unspent are on the current accumulator. The next thing you have to do is you have to add the new UTXOs to the accumulator and finally output this A new. Yeah, that's all the miner has to do. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Like, what if the uh, proof virtualization fails? Then the miner would need to kind of do the proof virtualization one by one because there's 
one you take so that may have failed. You have to do binary search. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. If it fails, yeah, so let's go with the easy path. Yeah. Let's go with a path where everything is, is, is working. And otherwise, there's, yeah, there's a recovery path you have to go through. So again, you see where I'm going. You see where this is headed in that um, the miner has to do quite a bit of work. The miner has to do Shamir's trick over here. And then the miner has to do all these exponentiations over here. But now suppose you wanted to verify that, uh, the mi that uh, this block is valid. So naively, other miners who want to verify blocks, they have to redo all this work. But instead, you see where we're going to go. Instead, what this miner who just did all the work to verify that, uh, that a block is valid, what this miner will do is he will also produce these proofs of exponentiation. Well, he will produce this A prime. And then he'll produce these proofs of exponentiation that the removal was done correctly and that the inclusion was done correctly. It's yeah? It's going to help other miners. It's going to help other miners. Exactly. That's exactly what it's going to do. Yeah, so one miner does the work, and now everybody else doesn't need to do anything. What about my profit? What? What about my profit? Well, you get paid for this work, right? If you don't produce the right proof, you don't get paid. Oh, the proof. Okay. Yeah. So there's a reason for everybody to do it. In the world of blockchains, you don't do anything for, for altruistic reasons. You do them because you get paid. Yeah, and so, yeah, so, right. What? No, there should be a payment mechanism for that. No, no, this is called a block reward. Every block has a block reward that pays the miner for their work. So, so the proof has to be part of the, uh, what you do? So the, the if the proof is invalid, you don't get paid. The block is rejected and you don't get paid. Okay. So the miners are incentivized to produce the right proof. Right. Everyone can very quickly check the right proof, right. and we're all set. Yeah, and now everybody only has 128 bytes or 256 bytes of uh, memory. They have to do a, a proof that's like, like really, this is like a very small exponentiation to verify that these blocks are valid. And we're done. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that so actually it turns out for the ease you don't. So you ask you asking how do you do the hash to prime? For, it turns out for the new UTXOs, you have to check. The old UTXOs, you don't have to check because they've already been verified when they were entered. For the new UTXOs, you would have to verify that those, those are... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We're saving on the exponentiations here. Yeah, so that's, that's what this does. It's a very good point. Okay, so, so, so let's see. So, the image, so the, let me just uh, go through these graphics of how this works. So basically today what happens is the miners collect a bunch of transactions and then they mint a block. But to do that, they have to store this huge UTXO set in memory to verify that the, the, the block is valid. Yeah, that the UTXOs really have been, uh, are not spent. Uh, with the accumulator model, basically, the miners only keep this accumulator in memory. Transactions come in with inclusion proofs. The miner do these checks. And then they just produce these, uh, these very short proofs of exponentiations, possibly along with, um, uh, yeah, with the, the, the primes that go, uh, that go into the new UTXOs. Uh, yeah, and that's basically, and then there's a new, and then the accumulator just changes to its new value, and that's it. So it's kind of a succinct way to verify the block. Yeah. Excellent question. So you ask, well, where did the group of unknown order come from? So if you're okay with trusted setup, you would use uh, Zn star mod plus minus one. If you are allergic to trusted setup, you would use class groups, and then you would have to pay a factor of 10 to 20 slowdown. Yeah, that's the, that's the result. So you don't have to use trusted setup for this. Yeah. Uh, you use a platform to record the ah, excellent. So there's a small issue here, which is where did these inclusion proofs come from? So the, the poor users, now ha we kind of shifted all the work from the miner to the users. The users now have to come up with these inclusion proofs. So where are they going to come up with, how are they going to come up with these inclusion proofs? Exactly. Every time, every time the accumulator value changes, the poor users have to update their inclusion proof, right? So yeah, so maybe if I'm a, u I'm a weak user on an iPhone, maybe it's hard work for me to update my inclusion proof. So that sounds like a business opportunity. Yes. <laughs> and so really, uh, the, the, the way this would work is there's another entity here, separate entity here, that all it does, its whole job, is just to help users get their inclusion proofs but it's a completely untrusted entity. There's no, it's not like a miner or anything. It really doesn't matter. You don't have to trust it for anything. All you have to do is just basically, it's, a, it's like a compute service 
that just, just um, updates your inclusion proof so that it's consistent with the current value of uh, the accumulator. And that now you can send to the prover, to the miner, and, uh, and we're done. So today, basically, the miners kind of do both of these things at once. Yeah, they're, they're, the miners are sort of the combination of these two entities. And with this approach, you would separate the miner from the person that updates the inclusion proofs. Um, and you know whether this works or not, who knows? So this is just a proposal. The untrusted is also for secrecy. Do you need to know? You don't, this guy doesn't need to know secret information. Doesn't need to know anything. Doesn't need to know anything. All he does is he takes the, your current inclusion proof and updates it to the new value of the accumulator. Mm -hmm. That's all it has to do. And it's easy to verify that it gave you the right value because it's a proof. So yeah, so it's just doing, it's like a compute server for you. It's not really, um, there's no trust involved in this. The, the, this guy, this guy would have to would have to store the whole blockchain. Yeah. So basically, what we're doing is we're moving the memory work from the miner to this other entity on the side. It's not on the critical path of anything. Today, the miners are like a, they're doing consensus and they have to have a lot of memory. We're just taking all the memory out of them, so they're easy, and we're just putting that on the side. Look, it's a, just another design point. It's an interesting application for accumulators. I'm not saying you're going to rush out and do this tomorrow. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that that's, that's actually possible. So, okay, so I'm going to end here. So the paper is up online. This has already been implemented. This is the beauty of this space. It looks like everything gets implemented very quickly. Uh, and I guess I should end with one open problem, which is, I guess I'll go back to Ali's point, um, which is everything I said here was kind of discrete log based. In fact, discrete log perhaps in groups of unknown order. Pre-quantum, that's exactly the open problem. So can we do the same tricks with compressing accumulator values uh, and compressing authentication paths, compressing authentication path in a post-quantum world? Yeah, so we don't know how to do that today, and that would be, that would be a, that's a pretty interesting problem uh, to think about, right? So same as Merkle trees, just have the ability to compress authentication path, path and uh, do it post-quantum. Okay, thank you very much, I'll stop here.